everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let's eat. Let's eat. Woo. What does the turkey say? Gobble, gobble, gobble. Boom. Yeah. The go, bro. We started. Yeah. And just when you think you're. That's all of us. Well, I have my cookie. Do you have yours? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take a bite? No matter how different it may look, everyone needs a Thanksgiving. Hey, machine. Share yours. Good morning again. Good to see everyone. Sorry if my voice is a little hoarse. I was acting like a goofball yesterday. Uh, I'm not sure how many soccer fans we have in the audience. Uh, Philadelphia Union are in the playoffs and they won in like the last minute of extra time. So, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But anyway, <clears throat> go Eagles. How about that? I mentioned last week that I feel, I feel blessed, especially blessed, around Thanksgiving, around the holiday time, because my, my holiday memories are, are positive, and I know not, not everyone has that blessing in their life. Uh, but they're, they're, they're positive and um, memorable because really not much ever went wrong, which is good. No disagreements around the table, no fights about politics, no polarizing talk about religion, and, and so on and so on. Just gathering around a, a bountiful table, spilling into uh, the family room or living room to watch football and, and to uh, doze in and out of a turkey coma. Just sounds like a, a perfect time, and that's the way our, our Thanksgivings usually were. However, I, I have to reveal to you this morning, I, I must get it off my chest, there is a, a Thanksgiving topic of contention between my wife and I. I'm going to share it. It's a serious one. It's very serious. And allow me to present it in a very Shakespearean way. To stuff or not to stuff, <laughs> that is the question. Yes, that's right. My strong opinion, my very strong opinion is that stuffing, you hear that word? Stuffing. It has to stuff something. It cannot be called stuffing if it's not stuffing Something. Dressing's fine, but that's not stuffing. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie does not want and will not eat stuffing that has been cooked inside the bird. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> to me, what she calls stuffing, or what some people call dressing, I guess, is, is simply wet breadcrumbs that you dry out in the oven. <laughs> it must be cooked inside the bird, whether that is a turkey or a duck. Sure, Carrie has presented to me, she's actually given me information from the USDA recommending that cooking, that the stuffing should be cooked outside of the bird because bacteria can survive if your stuffing doesn't reach a temperature of 165 degrees. Just turn the oven up. Let's, let's get it done. <laughs> in my 37 years of eating Thanksgiving, the correct way, inside the bird, I've never been sick. I've never been sick. Yes, that is the topic of contention. But thankfully, we actually have agreed to compromise. I get to, to stuff the bird. I stuff the, the back and the front of the bird. And she makes a separate dish that she puts in the oven, probably after the bird comes out, of, of wet bread comes. I mean, stuffing that she can <laughs> enjoy with her Thanksgiving meal. It's a balance of giving and receiving that results in all of us being happy on Thanksgiving Day. This morning, we conclude our series, Thanksgiving. And I hope you notice the emphasis on, on giving on your screen. Because often when we think of Thanksgiving, we picture a, a time around the table, sharing in a plentiful meal, 
And this is well and good. I, I want you to keep those memories. I want you to keep those thoughts. Uh, but often we come to Thanksgiving, we come to the, the buffet of, of, of Thanksgiving, looking for what we can receive rather than always searching for what we can bring, what we can give. So during this two-week series that started last week leading up to, to Thanksgiving, which I still cannot believe is right around the corner on Thursday, we, we will explore that God does not transform us in Christ simply to sit idle or to, to, to just stare at the sky waiting for Jesus' return. No, we are being transformed. We are being renewed in Christ Jesus so that we can have an impact in the lives of those around us, family, friends, neighbors, whoever. And we'll find that a, a, a life that is full of giving is a major ingredient to make such an impact. All right, so for this, this short series, for this, these past two weeks, we've been carving through the, the 12th chapter of Romans, and last week, like I said, we opened. We opened by uh, starting at the beginning at, at verse 1, and we saw that there was a therefore, and we had to look back a little bit to the previous chapter and, and so on, but, but that's natural. So far, the book of Romans has just been this beautiful exposition written by Paul of, about grace and about mercy that God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. And Paul begins wrapping up this letter. This is kind of a natural beginning of a conclusion as he still has a, a little bit to go, but he's starting to get to the, the meat of, of exactly what's going on and why he's writing this and the call to action. And he's telling the church what they ought to be doing or how they ought to be thinking, how they ought to be behaving, considering the fact that God is so faithful to us. The main initiative that we pulled from Scripture is that we are to give. And in verses 1 and 2, we explored this concept of giving our bodies as a living sacrifice. Giving ourselves of a transformed and renewed mind. Our, our thoughts are fixed on the Lord's. A life in Christ becomes less about what we can get and more about what we can give and how we can serve and, and, and the humility of a, a life that is devoted to God. God has, has gifted us with wonderful characteristics, wonderful abilities used for the betterment of others and, you, and used for the glory of the kingdom, and we give those back. We realize our, our talents and our gifts, or maybe that's something that we've worked on for, for many years, and we use those things as well to give back for the glory of God in a spirit of thanksgiving. And living one's life this way, with, with this new motivation and this new perspective and this new drive to just use the wholeness of yourself for the kingdom, for Christ Jesus, it literally changes how you live. It changes everything. So this morning, let's turn together and, and continue in Romans chapter 12 and, and continue where we left off and read Paul's words to the church beginning at verse 9. Romans 12, 9 through 13. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. A few weeks ago during our Mosaic series, if you were here or if you were watching online, participating online, uh, we talked about church hurt. Remember that series was, was kind of serious. But that's good. That's good every now and then to, to face some difficult things. And we talked about church hurt. And that's a difficult thing. And we talked about how a lot of the stories that we've maybe heard or, or instances of church hurt that we might know about or even the, the stuff that you've experienced in your own life, the hurt in church a lot of it stems from people not acting the way they, they are t they're teaching or they're preaching. In other words, it stems from hip hypocrisy or hypocritical behavior, uh, inauthentic behavior. And we read a, an account from Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus confronted the Pharisees head on. And, and the section that we read, he was kind of talking to his disciples with the Pharisees there, and I'm sure they, they could hear what was going on. But then he turns to them, and this is, we didn't read it, we read one of them, and uh, lays out some woes. Woe to you, Pharisees. And if you remember, 
uh, he, he confronted the way they taught, confronted the way they act, confronted the way they behaved. And in all that, I express my opinion that if Instagram was around in the first century, that the Pharisees would have absolutely loved it. They would have posted their photos of their phylacteries and their, and their uh, tassels and their, their, their beautiful garments and them next to scrolls and, and stuff like that. And they, it would have been amazing. So here in Romans 12, as Paul is unfolding this multifaceted list, this list of ethical qualities, moral qualities, all these behaviors and, and characteristics that Christians, the church, is to display, Paul begins with sincerity. Sincerity. Authenticity. Being who you say you are. Behaving as you say you believe. Within the same vein of Jesus' teachings, within the same vein of Jesus' claims against the Pharisees, Paul is, is teaching out against any behavior, uh, specifically love, that isn't true, that isn't sincere. Love that is not sincere, what is it? It's definitely hypocritical, and I, I'm going to go ahead and just say that love that's not sincere isn't even really love. Because what is it? If we're talking about social media for a moment, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, those Pharisees, they would have loved. They would have loved Instagram. But the way Paul, in these verses, is just shooting off these short little spurts, tackling behavior after behavior, Ethical quality after ethical quality, characteristic after characteristic. By the way, he is shooting off these short statements and commands and these five verses that we just read. This would be perfect Twitter material. This would be perfect. And you know what? If, if Paul, the Apostle Paul had Twitter, I would sign up for it immediately. That would be great. Short, concise blast, just shaping and molding the moral compass of, of believers, of the church, of the Christ followers, not on Twitter, but here in the book of Romans, to the church in Rome. So looking back to, to verse 9, again, it's probably not going to be on your screen. It is, actually. I'm sure that many of you heard that in the Greek language, Greek has eight forms, eight different forms of the word love. Unfortunately, the English, English language fails when it comes to the word love. I mean, it's still a good word, but it just fails at its, its breadth of, of vocabulary. It's not very specific. It is incredibly broad, too broad. Because in the same breath, I can say, I love my wife, and I love pizza. The two don't compare. I guess depending on on the pizza place that I'm, that I'm talking about. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. The word doesn't do justice uh, without, without having to explain yourself. What do you mean that you love your wife and you love pizza? Well, I have to, to, to surround those words with an explanation of, of what exactly I'm talking about and, and kind of beef up and explain what type of love it is. Here in verse 9, Paul uses a very specific Greek word for love that I'm sure many of you have heard before, especially if you've been in the church for a while, and that word is agape, agape, agape love. In the biblical use of the term, it simply means divine love. In the biblical use of the term, it means divine love. In antiquity, agape, in the Greek culture, in the Greco-Roman culture, it meant Preferred love, preferred love, biblically crafted and molded and in, in, in its biblical use, uh, kind of taken from the culture and used to mean the type of love that God prefers, divine love, the type of love that God prefers. The moral culture of the Christian, uh, the, the church as a whole, all of us here this morning, no matter where you are, must be driven by this type of love for others. Divine love, the type of love that God would prefer you to have with others. And within that, 
Paul lists this, these, this series of short statements which round out our behavior, the things that we actually do, not, not just on Sunday, all throughout the week toward every single person we encounter. This is the type of love that God would prefer you to use, would prefer you to display, would prefer you to put into action all the days of your life, especially, and Paul makes this clear, especially towards your family and your church. Because if you can't get it right in your family or in your church family, you don't have a chance with your, with your enemy. Love sincerely. Hate evil. Be devoted to others. Honor others. Be passionate. Serve. Be joyful. Be patient. Pray often. Share. Be generous. Paul boils this down. These are characteristics of what we talked about last week. Remember, it's the same paragraph. These are characteristics of a, of a body that is a living sacrifice. These are characteristics of a mind that is transformed that is renewed in Christ Jesus. These are the qualities of thanksgiving. The ultimate way a Christian, the ultimate way that you and I can demonstrate the outpouring of that thanks, thankfulness, not just by sitting around a table, but demonstrating the outpouring of thanksgiving in our lives as a whole, brought on by a, a life that is now transformed by Christ, is by living this way is by following these short spurts, is by living agape love. We all know circumstances in our lives can jostle our thankfulness, can mess with our heads, can make us lose proper perspective. We all know that we are abundantly blessed. We all, all of us here know that every single one of us is abundantly blessed. Compared to much of the world, we are blessed beyond measure. Even if you have a couple bucks in your checking account, waiting on, on payday, you are still richer than the majority of the world. Keep that in perspective. But even in our fortuitous circumstances, even though we have that head knowledge, even though we learn those stats from time to time, we will experience difficulties that jostle our thankfulness. Hardships that kind of mess up our perspective and sometimes rock our, our thankful meter. I heard a, a fable about a mother and a son who lived alone together in, in a shack in the woods. And a, a bad storm began picking up on the horizon. And living in a shack, they didn't really have anywhere to go, uh, to feel safe, to feel secure. And they noticed that the storm began intensifying and became a tornado. So they ran outside uh, to, to find a, a ditch to lay in, but the wind began whipping up so fast and so strong that they found themselves almost being lifted up off the ground. So the mother directed her son, uh, not knowing anything else to do, to just grab on to the nearest tree and hold on for dear life. And there they stood, holding on to these trees uh, for dear life. When the boy began losing his grip, he, he couldn't hold on any longer and he got sucked up into the tornado. The mother began to weep and to pray, begging the Lord for her son's return. She prayed, Lord, this boy is, is all I have. Please bring him back to me alive, and if you do, I will serve you all the days of my life. Not long after, the, the tornado kind of dissipated and, and moved on, and the mother heard some rustling behind her as she ungripped from the tree in a raspy voice. She heard, Mom, I'm okay. Overcome with, with shock and emotion, the mother turned and, and ran and, and embraced her, her son, joyous beyond belief. Not long, not long after this long hug, she leaned back and, and just gazed into the eyes of her boy and at her boy's face and just... Just looked at him for a while, and her, and her joyful smile turned into a frown. She glanced to the sky, now praying, Lord, 
he was wearing a hat before all this. Can I please get that back too? Sometimes we, in our blessed condition, can lose the proper perspective of exactly how blessed we are in our abundance, in our even over abundance as, as Americans, even small annoyances can begin to deteriorate, can begin to make us lose focus at what we are truly blessed with. A life that should just be full, overflowing with thanksgiving. And although Paul does write quite a large list here, and, and the way he, he, he spells it out, these characteristics and these qualities that should accompany our faith, I think that he knows that the pitfalls of life can definitely invade, can definitely invade, can definitely hinder us. So in verse 14, he goes a little bit deeper and begins to include some actual scenarios that, that the people in Rome and the church at Rome might face and that you and I might face as well. Verses 14 through 21. Bless those who persecute you, Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be, do not overcome not evil, but overcome evil with good. Last week we talked about the things that Paul presented as, as he opened up, as we opened up this chapter, uh, were very different, and they would sound very odd to someone living in the first century because they were very countercultural to the way people actually behaved and, and the social conditions of the first century. The Greco-Roman way of life is not in line with the Christian way of life, and this fact continues. Same paragraph, Paul's continuing the, the same thought thread. Remember, the church in Rome to whom Paul is writing is a beautifully diverse congregation. A beautifully diverse congregation. The church is composed of a, a large mix of, of Jews of long heritage, along with people from all nations and all backgrounds. Rome was, was a place where people were coming and going. So you had a, 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 a beautiful mix of all different types of people with different cultural baggage and, and heritages and, and, and so on and so forth. Yet what Paul is asking of these people, although much of this is, is definitely rooted in Hebrew scripture, directly speaks to everyone. Directly speaks to everyone who is listening. He's not saying, oh, you need to do this if you're from this background or if you're this, this gender or this, you need to do this or that. What he's saying here speaks to everyone from every background, from every culture, so on and so forth. These are holy behaviors. These are holy behaviors for us. This is divine love that we are to dis display and inhabit and follow after. Flowing, all this stuff, flows from a transformed life, flows from a renewed mind in Christ. This is Christ-likeness that we are following after. Blessings, not curses. Rejoicing, mourning, living in harmony, humility, not taking revenge, living in peace. These are the teachings of Jesus. Gospelized behavior. Behavior that has been changed because of the gospel introduced in a life. And gospelized behavior often looks very different than the behavior of the culture. You should not and you ought not look the exact same before Christ and after Christ or with Christ. Now, I don't know how many movies you watch, uh, but revenge, revenge is a major theme 
in many storylines in, in Hollywood, I guess you could say. Uh, our, our bookshelves are, are filled with revenge. Our, our culture's film reels are filled with revenge. Our Netflix watch lists are filled with revenge. Unforgiven, Ocean's Eleven, Princess Bride, Count of Monte Cristo, Braveheart, Gladiator, Taken, John Wick, so on and so forth. I think there's a TV show called Revenge. The, the, the list could go on and on. Revenge is a very popular plot line in many movies, in many shows, in many books, uh, in our culture, and in the cultures that preceded us. Why? It's kind of easy to write revenge stories. That's, that's one reason. But revenge builds this animosity towards the antagonist. You're building this hatred, resentment towards the, the bad guy in the story, and it's allowing the reader and the viewer to, to also build that anticipation. Man, I hate that guy. I just can't wait till the, the good guy gets him type of thing. That feeling of just go get him. Go, go teach him a lesson. Kick his butt. And that just builds throughout, throughout the entire story as you're reading or as, as you're watching. The story unfolds as the main character is motivated to act upon that which wronged him. He wants revenge. Paul says, no, that's not the way of Christ. Your family member might have wronged you this past year, but no. Thanksgiving is not the proper time to confront them at the table. If that crazy uncle who, who only wants to talk politics is there around the Thanksgiving table this year, no, Thanksgiving is not the appropriate time to give him an earful in return. Paul suggests in his words in Romans, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. As difficult as it might be to maybe have to bite your tongue, one of the greatest gifts that you can give this Thanksgiving is the gift of humility and the gift of peace and the gift of blessing to your family and your friends and your neighbors and your enemies. We don't take revenge. We don't avenge ourselves. Paul says, leave this to God. We don't always have to take matters into our own hands. Just think about it. Think about this. You don't need a transformed life. You don't need a renewed mind to take revenge. That's easy. That's almost like second nature, human nature. You can feel it welling up within you, and you're just going to act upon it. That's easy. That, that doesn't take a renewed mind. That doesn't take your body being a living sacrifice. But in order to do big things, like exercise humility, in order to hold back that strong retort, in order to, to offer unwelcomed peace to whomever that person is, you have to draw from something. You have to draw from the gospel in your life. You must draw from the spirit that is driving your life. You must draw from a Christ-centered mind. That is the well that you're drawing from. That is the well that you're, you're giving from on Thanksgiving. Living sacrifice. Renewed and transformed mind. And church, we know that this, we know that's not easy. This is not easy. It's not easy to do. It's not at all. But it's the way that we can work. And maybe you'll mess up. But, but this is the way that we work the will of God out in our lives. These bodies of living sacrifice. 
setting ourselves aside. That's why it's a sacrifice. To be driven by the Spirit. So when we pull back this lens and we look at these words here in Romans chapter 12 and we see that this behavior of doing good to even those who oppose you is the, is the driving force. Your behavior is the driving force often towards opening the door of the Spirit for their lives. For their lives. Yeah, you can go all Arnold Schwarzenegger on them and, and, and whatever and, and get your revenge, but what are they going to learn about Jesus by you doing that? You're not giving them anything that they don't already know. Your thanksgiving is becoming a visible cue of the work of God in your life. When we act like Jesus... When we act like Jesus in, in a culture that doesn't know him or around people who don't know him, that looks strange. That looks strange. Why? Because you can't act like that on your own. You can't act like that on your own accord. Hey, why are you doing that? Oh, I'm just an awesome person. No. I'm doing that because of Jesus in my life. You need the inner working of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need Jesus. You need the gospel to act in these ways. You need the church. You need the community of faith to support you as well. And Paul shows that. Paul shows that in the words that we read as he ended chapter 12 using exclusively plural verbs. Plural verbs. We're not as used to that in our culture as they were, especially in the first century. The church, we got to be countercultural just as much as Paul called the church to be countercultural. We got to be in this together. The only individual, the only individual who can change the world, who did change the world, was Christ Jesus. From here on out, it's us. It's plural. It's you and I. It's us together who are going to change the world. The church is going to change the world. The church is God's chosen vehicle to continue his ministry here on earth. A community that continues the work in the world in his name. Not individuals. The collective church. The good news of the gospel, and I truly love this, you don't only get a new heart. Because we talk a lot about heart. It makes sense. But you get a new brain, in a way, and a new, a new mind, a new way of thinking. We need a new head. You need a new head, you need a new mind, you need a, a, a new way of, of thinking. Because it just doesn't, it doesn't work if, unless you, you start that path of transformed mind, renewed mind. You need a, that radical, new, strange, unusual way of thinking that is gospelized against the, the culture of the day. You need, like, like Paul says, to behave in a way that ends up heaping burning coals on your enemy. And that sounds like a pretty cool thing to do. That sounds like a... a Stallone move, a Schwarzenegger move. But in the, the culture, in the Hebrew culture, that, that was borrowed from the, from the Old Testament, that means you're bringing them to repentance along with you. It's an ancient metaphor. You are provoking them to realize their way of life and change it for the sake of the Lord who is faithful and who loves them and who wants them to align their wills with his. And that is possible, and that is motivated by people who are not living by the pattern of the world, who are not thinking by the pattern of the world either. And this is the central idea of how Paul thinks and how we must think. Why? Because we are not living by the pattern of the world. 
because Jesus rose from the dead. The new age began when he stepped out of that tomb. It might not seem like it. It might seem like the enemy still has a, has a foothold. But Christ became king, and he established his reign. The death and resurrection of Christ Jesus ushered in with it new creation and new life, hope for the glory to come. God's new world and his new creation, though, have already begun. And through the gospel, we who put our faith in him become transformed into his image until he returns. Romans chapter 12 does such a wonderful job of encapsulating all of this stuff in light of thanksgiving. God's new humanity is now on display, and it should be on display in the church. New humanity in Christ on display in each and every one of us. Yeah, we're going to mess up, but we have each other to support each other, to forgive each other, to brush each other off, and to continue to walk in the same direction, to walk in the ways of the Lord. Living sacrifices with renewed hearts and renewed minds. So this Thanksgiving, bring that to your table. Bring Christ Jesus to your table. And if someone ever asks you or happens to to wonder, why do you behave the way you behave? Why do you serve me in this this weird way why do you love me like you do why don't you seek vengeance why don't you avenge that person who wronged you who in the world acts like that what's going on in your life you can just smile and you can answer Jesus acts like that and Jesus did that with me While I was his enemy, he loved me anyway. He gave himself up for me, and he washed away my sin. And now, because of that, my life is bound in new creation. My hope is in him, and I patiently await his return. Along with all those who have ever trusted him as well. And thanks be to God the door is open for you too. So as the worship team comes forward here this morning, this Thanksgiving, may God bless you. May God bless you and may you, if only for the first time, maybe it's the first time, may you see yourself the way the Lord of all creation sees you. And may you respond to that amazing love with thanksgiving and praise and step into the new life that he wants to walk with you in. So if this morning God is calling you into a relationship with him, will you respond to that by accepting Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior? being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, and walking in the newness of life. Or if you need prayer this morning, our elders will be up here as well. Let's all stand.